Albedo is a measure of the reflectivity of a surface or body. It is defined as the ratio in the amount of sunlight that is reflected versus the amount of sunlight that strikes a surface. Coal has an albedo of 10%, the moon an albedo of 7%. Of the known asteroids larger than about 25 kilometers or 16 miles across the so-called planet killers, 78% have albedos of 2 to 7%. Trying to spot them is harder than spotting a city-sized lump of coal sailing silently through the blackness of space. On February 13th, 2013, the very same day space agencies around the world reported confidently that a 30-meter asteroid will come close to but will miss the Earth, an asteroid we didn't spot entered Earth's atmosphere over Russia. The calmness of this scene and the brilliant spectacle of the trail of light streaking across the sky deceived the danger of the situation. As observers rushed to their windows to watch, at 30 kilometers or 18.5 miles above the Earth's surface, the intense explosion from the object's atmospheric entry created a bright flash and produced a hot cloud of dust and gas. This briefly appeared brighter than the sun and caused severe sunburns to those outside. The blast was equivalent to 500 kilotons of TNT, about 30 times the energy released from the Hiroshima atomic bomb. The shockwave that then arrived minutes later damaged over 7,000 buildings in a 90 kilometer area and caused over a thousand injuries as glass windows shattered in the faces of observers. The Chelyabinsk meteor was just 20 meters across. This places it in a category of small near-Earth objects. Anything up to 25 meters across and typically burn up on entry may be producing a meteor or shooting star event. These near-Earth objects make up the majority of objects entering Earth's atmosphere. The next size up of near-Earth objects, those approximately 30 to 50 meter in diameter, Tunguska-like objects, are classified after a 1908 event near the Tunguska River in Siberia, Russia. It was the largest impact event ever recorded in history to have occurred over land. It flattened 2,000 square kilometers of Siberian forest, knocking down around 80 million trees. It was estimated to be the equivalent of 10 to 15 megatons of TNT, about a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Objects larger than this are city killers, approximately 100 meters to one kilometer in diameter. Above one kilometer, these are planet killers, objects that can fundamentally rewrite the environment on a global scale. The Chicxulub impactor, an asteroid estimated to be 10 to 15 kilometers in diameter, is the primary culprit behind the Cretaceous mass extinction event that killed the dinosaurs approximately 66 million years ago. It struck near the present-day Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. The colossal impact carved out a crater more than 150 kilometers across and 20 kilometers deep. This catastrophic collision resulted in a vast release of energy, igniting continent-sized wildfires and triggering enormous tsunamis. The impact hurled massive amounts of debris, dust, and gas into the atmosphere, leading to a prolonged impact winter. This darkened, colder period saw a sharp decline in sunlight and significantly disrupted global ecosystems and food chains that may have already been stressed due to the volcanic activity in the Deccan Traps at the time. We find evidence of this supporting asteroid's role in the mass extinction event in the form of a worldwide layer of iridium-rich clay, an element rare in Earth's crust but abundant in asteroids. The good news is that over 90% of near-Earth objects larger than one kilometer are believed to have been found and tracked, and none of them at this point in time pose an imminent threat of collision with Earth in our lifetimes. But for asteroids smaller than this, the confidence level drops frighteningly quickly. For medium-sized near-Earth objects, those less than a kilometer but greater than about 150 meters in diameter, only roughly 40% of these objects are believed to have been found. And of the ones we've found, no matter how sophisticated our telescopes and measurement instruments become, there will always be a limit to how precisely we can determine the current position or velocity of an asteroid. Chaos theory refers to the study of systems in which 
small changes in initial conditions can result in vastly different outcomes. These tiny uncertainties can grow exponentially over long timescales, making accurate prediction of an asteroid's path centuries into the future incredibly challenging. This is further complicated as the gravitational influences from other planets and bodies can subtly alter an asteroid's trajectory. Over time, these small changes accumulate, leading to significant alterations in the object's path. There are also non-gravitational forces at play like the Yarkovsky effect. When an asteroid absorbs sunlight, its sun-facing surface heats up. As the asteroid rotates, the surface that was heated by the sun moves into shadow and begins to cool down, emitting previously absorbed energy as infrared radiation. This emission is not uniform in all directions and the net effect of emitting this radiation provides a tiny thrust, again moving the asteroid off its predicted course over time. Potentially hazardous objects are a subset of near-Earth objects that have orbits bringing them close to Earth while being large enough to cause significant regional damage in the event of an impact. As of 2022, over 2,500 potentially hazardous objects have been identified and mapped, but the actual number is believed to be much higher. But if we did find an asteroid on course to collide with Earth, what would we do? One potentially hazardous object of particular interest is Bennu. Bennu is believed to be a relic from the early solar system, over 4.5 billion years old, a B-type asteroid, meaning it's rich in carbon-based molecules. Some of those molecules could be the organic precursors to life as we know it. Understanding the nature and distribution of these molecules on Bennu could provide hints about the role of asteroids in possibly seeding life on Earth. But Benno's orbit brings it periodically close to Earth's orbit, and its size at 490 meters in diameter, roughly the height of the Empire State Building, and its mass of 73 million metric tons around 13 Great Pyramids of Giza is substantial enough to cause significant country, potentially continent-wide damage if it were to impact Earth. It's estimated to be moving at 28 kilometers per second or about 63,000 miles per hour. This gives it a possible energy equivalent if it were to impact of over a gigaton of TNT. That's over 200 times more powerful than the Tunguska event or 200,000 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. And Bennu is one of the most likely objects to hit Earth, with its likelihood peaking in the late 22nd century. While the likelihood is very small as of the latest assessments, the cumulative chance of impact between 2175 and 2199 is about 1 in 2700. Now while this might not sound like a lot, it would only take us being slightly wrong about its orbit to turn a near miss into a collision. So groups like NASA have already begun to design missions that aim at diverting such events. The first challenge is simply getting a technology in place to its intended target. On September 8th, 2016, atop an Atlas V rocket from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, NASA launched the OSIRIS-REx mission to intercept and study Bennu. Rather than taking a direct route, the spacecraft utilized an Earth Gravity Assist maneuver approximately one year after launch on September 22, 2017. This Gravity Assist helped change the spacecraft's trajectory to align it with Bennu's orbital plane, making the rendezvous possible. Throughout its voyage traveling over 2 billion kilometers, OSIRIS performed several trajectory correcting maneuvers or TCMs to refine its path. On December 3rd, 2018, after several braking TCMs to match its speed relative to the asteroid, OSIRIS finally arrived and entered orbit around Bennu. This precise navigation across deep space provides agencies like NASA with the essential skills needed to intercept, mine, or take some other approach to possibly diverting an asteroid in the future. It was films like Armageddon that instilled in us the idea that nuclear explosion near, on, or beneath the surface of an asteroid is the obvious choice for deflecting or destroying inbound celestial threats. But sidestepping the political complications of putting a nuke in space, how does this work practically? In 2021, planetary defense researchers at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory ran simulations based on the mass and composition of asteroids to find out. A nuclear explosion in the vacuum of space next to or on the surface of an asteroid works differently to how it works on the surface or above the Earth. 
In an atmosphere, a nuclear explosion produces a blast wave due to the rapid expansion of superheated air. In space, there is no atmosphere to produce this traditional force transmitting shock wave, but the explosion still releases a vast amount of energetic particles. If the explosion is close enough, these particles can impart momentum to the asteroid, although this effect would be significantly weaker than if it was on Earth, where the mass of the superheated air would also be exerting a force. From a blast on the surface of an asteroid, thermal radiation and neutron and x-ray heating would likely be a significantly larger contributor to the force felt on the asteroid's surface, as it would be rapidly vaporized, expelling material from one side of the asteroid at high velocity. This action, through Newton's third law, would produce a reaction that pushes the asteroid in the opposite direction. This process is sometimes referred to as ablation and can change the asteroid's trajectory significantly. Ablation is also sometimes proposed from a laser source rather than a bomb source. A high-powered laser, either stationed on Earth or on a nearby spacecraft, could be used to vaporize the surface of an asteroid. However, at the moment, there simply aren't lasers powerful enough for this approach to be practical. What's important to understand, though, is that these ablation approaches aren't a push. They're a violent ejection of fast material, and depending Depending on the asteroid's composition and the explosion's proximity, this might result in multiple large chunks that could still pose a threat to Earth. The research team found that objects 100 meters or less could be annihilated by a low megaton range nuclear device with a 99% certainty that its mass would be reduced to objects that would burn up in Earth's atmosphere. However, this approach would be significantly less effective on larger asteroids, which are the ones that pose the greatest threat. Even if this sort of approach was initially successful, over time, the many small chunks may gravitationally re-attract and re-aggregate. In fact, some asteroids are exactly this. Rather than a solid metallic asteroid like 16 Psyche that is the ultra-hard exposed core fragment of an early planet, some asteroids are more of a gravitationally bound rubble pile floating through space rather than a single solid object. One of the simplest ideas to divert an asteroid called a kinetic impactor is simply to send a spacecraft to collide with an asteroid at high speed and use the momentum transfer from the impact to nudge the asteroid onto a slightly different trajectory, hopefully out of the direction of Earth. But does this process work if the asteroid is one of these rubble pile bodies? Launched on November 24th, 2021, NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, mission's primary goal was to demonstrate this asteroid deflection approach on a rubble pile asteroid. Targeting the binary asteroid system Didymos, DART set its sights on the smaller moonlet Didymos B, sometimes called Dimorphos, which is approximately 160 meters in diameter. The mission's goal wasn't attempting to shift Didymos B's primary orbit around the Sun, but rather its secondary orbit around the larger Didymos A. Didymos B's orbit was measured prior to the mission as taking 11 hours and 55 minutes to orbit its larger counterpart. On September 26, 2022, DART collided with Didymos B at a speed of 6.6 .6 kilometers per second. And as of March 2023, post-impact measurements confirmed that the impact shortened this period of orbit to 11 hours and 23 minutes, a reduction of 32 minutes in total. This confirmed that kinetic impact into rubble pile asteroids does in fact transfer sufficient momentum to alter trajectories. Other considered approaches like detonating a bomb inside the asteroid or deploying a mass driver on the surface of an asteroid where material is mined then accelerated and fired into space in one direction to move the asteroid in the other direction both come with the problem of drilling into the asteroid. Here, exerting a force on the asteroid pushes the spacecraft away if it isn't secured to the surface, which isn't always possible as the surface of asteroids is often loose and not connected directly to the main mass. Drilling in low gravity also kicks up material that potentially clogs and disrupts the spacecraft. Teams at NASA have looked at mass drivers since the 70s and noted another concern, asteroid spin that may mean mass drivers could only be active while the mass driver was oriented opposite to the direction of desired thrust. Thrust could still be delivered on a spinning asteroid, even if it was only for short windows of time each day, but this may mean that a mass driver mission would need to be deployed with significant time ahead of a potential impact to have time to be effective. 
To better understand the composition and conditions on Bennu, Osiris began mapping the asteroid's surface to identify a safe and scientifically valuable site where the spacecraft would attempt a collection of the surface material. On October 20th, 2020, Osiris used a device called the Touch and Go Sample Acquisition Mechanism, or TAGSAM, an articulated arm with a circular sampler head at the end of it, which was designed to touch the asteroid's surface briefly and collect a sample of this material. The spacecraft slowly and carefully descended to the asteroid's surface. Once the sampler head made contact, it released a burst of nitrogen gas, which stirred up and lifted small rocks and dust from the surface, capturing them inside the TAGSAM head. OSIRIS has also taken some of the most accurate study measurements of the Yarkovsky effect on the asteroid to date, potentially opening up the opportunity to adjust the Yarkovsky effect on the asteroid as a possible approach to diverting it. The spacecraft was equipped with the OSIRIS-REx Thermal Emission Spectrometer, or Oats, which measured the intensity and wavelength of the infrared energy emitted from Bennu. These measurements helped determine the asteroid's temperature as it rotated at one revolution every 4.5 hours. OSIRIS also produced a detailed shape model important in understanding how Bennu re-emits absorbed sunlight from its surface. Future techniques could aim to darken, lighten, or reshape the asteroid's surface to impart a slow thermal driver, moving the asteroid out of a direct trajectory. Just a few short years ago, if we'd been presented with this existential crisis of an imminent asteroid strike, we wouldn't have many options to turn to. We definitely are still a long way from being in a position to say we can handle anything the universe can throw at us, but the close observations and eventual contact with Bennu gave us a detailed understanding of its surface properties, including texture, consistency, and potential hazards vital for future asteroid missions. On September 24th, 2023, just a week ago, the sample landed back from Bennu onto Earth. This will fuel scientists' investigation into the compounds that existed at the formation of the solar system, but it will also teach us about the material properties and potential forces acting on the asteroid, essential to accurately predict its trajectory. About 20 minutes after ejecting the sample to Earth, OSIRIS fired its engines to divert past Earth towards its new mission an asteroid called Apophis. At roughly 300 meters in diameter, Apophis will come within 20,000 miles of Earth, less than one-tenth the distance between the Earth and the Moon as early as 2029. So Osiris's work must continue. Hey guys, thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, feel free to give us a thumbs up, leave a comment down below if you have questions. Otherwise, thank you as always. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.